Welcome to Vision Chats, where the only thing that matters is the future. Uh, I am Farouk Day, Vice Provost at Johns Hopkins University, and I am thrilled to have my good friend and colleague, Lindsay Pollock, as my guest today. Lindsay, how are you? Farouk, thank you so much for having me. Cheers. I've got my coffee cup ready for our conversation. So glad to be joining you today. It's a pleasure to have you. Uh, for everyone here, um, go and uh, buy uh, Lindsay's books. They're amazing. Lindsay is uh, well known ar uh, around the country and around the world as a multi -gener generational work expert, uh, a speaker, a best selling author of the books College to Career. Uh, Becoming the Boss, The Remix, and then your la latest venture, um, Recalculating, which I cannot wait to get my hands on that book. And boy, did you pick the, the that title correctly. Did you know, the, the did you pick that title before or after COVID? I'm so glad you asked this question because titles are really hard for me. And as you know, my first book was called Getting from College to Career. It could not be a more boring, you know, obvious title. Um, so what happened was, and this sounds so fake, but it's true. Um, in May, the beginning of May, my agent called me and said, I feel like you should write a book right now. I feel like you, you have a book in you um, that needs to come out. And I said, I do. I just keep picturing people driving in their cars, going down the wrong path, you know, detours, all these feelings we had during COVID. And I said, I just keep thinking of my GPS saying recalculating recalculating and it, it sort of popped oh. into my head right away and then that was the vision talk about vision chat that was the vision for the book we are all recalculating right now so the the idea of the book came with that title and um it's really resonating with people i've been really gratified uh, but, uh, so very good i did not think of that sound of the gps recalculating but now it, it won't leave my head <laughs> thank you so much um Listen, everyone. So, if you, you're not, uh, if you don't know this, uh, you might notice it uh, from reading um, uh, Lindsay's many articles and op-eds. She's the ultimate defender of uh, the millennial generation and Gen Z generation. I loved your posts about stop shaming uh, these generations. And I feel like the moment that we're in now, um, post COVID nineteen, uh, that will happen hopefully, and during COVID nineteen. This is an interesting moment for these generations to emerge as leaders of the workplace of the future. What are the themes that you've picked up on during your research for this book um, and that, uh, that support that idea? I feel like this is a really turning point, an interesting turning point for uh, Gen Z and for millennials. Yeah, um, something I've heard you say, Farouk, and I think a lot of experts are saying right now is that COVID didn't really change things. It accelerated changes that were already underway. And I feel like people who really pay attention to demographics and career services and hiring and talent have really been saying, you know, kind of like people thought we were crazy 15 years ago and a little less crazy 10 years ago. You know, the millennials and Gen Zs are coming. They're going to be the majority. They're communication style, their way of working is going to be the norm. And people kept saying, yeah, 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 sure. And what we're seeing is flexibility, diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, you know, uh, attention to mental health and focus on culture, all of these things that are becoming so prominent because of this rapid move to remote work, we've been sort of saying from the sidelines for so long. And interestingly, I think the companies that were forward thinking and started to um, offer flexibility, offer more technology communication, pay attention to diversity, equity, inclusion, said, yeah, we were ready, you know, someone like you. And then a lot of other companies were absolutely caught off guard and on their heels because they didn't really believe this stuff was coming. Um, I think one of the dangers, though, is to think that what we're in right now with remote work is in any way normal. I mean, you know, nobody feels like this is what we meant. You know, <laughs> we didn't want to be entirely remote, you know, and entirely disconnected from people. So I think it's worth thinking that the future is certainly going to be some sort of combination of the past and now. But I think a lot of the themes that millennials have pushed for for years are now coming into play. And people are realizing that that really was true. We just didn't think it would happen this quickly. You know, so w one of the words that uh, I'm usually uncomfortable with whenever we talk about transitions into the future is the word hybrid. I'm uncomfortable with it because uh, 
while it allows us to uh, uh, achieve some type of balance, for me also, it, it can be a crutch that we use for not tr truly transforming mm -hmm. and for not truly changing um, and not taking the bold and audacious moves. So I'm, I'm wondering if, what would that look like if we go into a combination of both, of uh, hybrid and still in person in the future? So we're thinking two or three years down the road, hopefully COVID-19 is way behind us at that point. And we, you're right, we construct this new normal. What would that look like? Um, and how do we com combine these, the, the, these two parts of our, our world of work? So I don't mind the term hybrid. I, I hear what you're saying. Um, what I like about it, or the idea of mixture or remix, like my book mm -hmm. title, is I never liked the idea. And people used to ask me this all the time. Do we do things the baby boomer way or the millennial way? It was always this like black and white choice that it was the past or the future, the good or the bad, the, you know, the right or the wrong. And I think that's never the solution. I really think we need to live in the gray. And so I think where the hybrid comes in is it doesn't force us into this fake choice between one way or the other. So I've always been a fan of more options, more flexibility, thinking and instead of or, make the pie bigger instead of splitting it into two. And so when I think about the future of hybrid, for example, I just have been doing a research project with uh, Capfinity, the HR tech company, and we've been interviewing companies about their hiring. And what they say is, oh, absolutely, boy, are we going to double down on virtual recruiting, but we never want it to be 100% of our recruiting because that in-person, face-to-face human connection is so important. So if the mix had been 90% in-person and 10% virtual, those might flip-flop, but we're still going to have both. I don't think anyone sees a future where we are 100% virtual. I think what will probably happen is that the technologically based communication will become more human, which we've even seen with Zoom, right? You and I probably would have never jumped on a Zoom in the past. And now it's a no brainer that we would Zoom instead of talking on the phone. So that's already kind of elevated. Um, but my fear is that we go 100% in the opposite direction towards virtual and we lose the good parts of the human. So you know, to, to quote my own book, The Remix, which by the way, if you don't want to read it, it makes a really good laptop stand for uh, Zoom conversations <laughs> to make sure you're at eye level, which is how I use my books. Um, I like the idea of a remix, which is that you mix the old and the new, the virtual and the human, and you mix it in different ways and different formulas. So just to give a really quick example of the workplace, maybe we go to a model where you have A teams and B teams, right? And A teams are there Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and B teams are there Tuesday, Thursday. Or you have core hours on certain days where everybody goes that everybody isn't 100% back in the office, but they're also not 100% virtual. And, you know, I look to the millennials and Gen Zs to come up with some of the really innovative ideas for how we can make that mix work in a way that isn't total chaos, which is also not a good thing. Yeah, you know, you're making me think of um, uh, schools also and how they will operate in the future because they're already talking about these um, school shifts, uh, kind of like work shifts. Um, uh, is, is, is that what we're looking at for um, uh, education or even for colleges? Is that what we're looking at in the future? Um, I asked this in the context of post-COVID-19. So I'm not, I mean, right now it's it's normal to be thinking about that, but you know, five years down the road, is this where we're, where we're headed? Uh, is that education will discover that there is a much more efficient way to um, to deliver the educational experience at scale? I think we will. And, and it's going to sound like I'm dodging your question, but I'm not trying to. I'm, I'm a real believer that um, you probably heard this said before. The mind of the person who created the problem is probably not the mind that's going to solve it. I, I want to get a bunch of 10 year olds in a room and ask what they think it should look like, because I think I know I am so ingrained in the idea that school is a classroom with desks and a teacher. And that doesn't have to be the case. So I think when you get out of that mindset that we've had for centuries of exactly what a schoolroom has to look like, that's where some of the creativity can happen. And I think the younger people who don't have that limiting belief are gonna be really creative. I mean, my daughter is nine years old, she's in fourth grade. School to her now is hybrid. It's this Google Classroom on two days a week, it's in-person three days a week. That's going to be normal for her. And these college kids who are having these hybrid models of college, it's already starting to expand their thinking of what's possible. So I think my brain is too, my brain is too 
sort of caught in the old way to, to know. So I'm really watching some of the more creative solutions to this um, to see what's going to come. But I'd love to hear from you. I mean, you're more in it on the higher ed side than I am for sure. Well, I was actually thinking that I'm in it, uh, just watching my, my own kids to, to go through this at home. Um, and um, uh, it occurred to me the other day that my kindergartner, you know, I have, I have a daughter who's in kindergarten, garden, who doesn't know um, school any other way. I mean, this yeah. was her first year, her first educational experience, and it was all via Zoom, you know, and it's, uh, there is no hybrid element to it. Um, and, uh, while there's disappointment there for the personal experience, you know, to the, the, the connection, the, in person with other kids, I see her just flying through this experience. And this, she, this is what she will remember. And I'm thinking that there's a generation, an entire generation of kids. I don't know if we're going to call them the zoom generation. I don't know what they will be called in the future. I've heard <laughs> coronials is the, is the stereotype, uh, the coronial. No, I prefer zoom, <laughs> but could be the coronials, coronials. There's an entire generation here uh, that uh, will be impacted by how they're experiencing school right now and their social abilities, their the way they connect, also the way they interact with technology. It's amazing to me that my kindergartner, the things that she's doing with an iPad and a computer that no way I would have done, <laughs> you know, back the, back then. So I'm looking at it also with that researcher mind thinking that this is, this is a really interesting moment uh, to watch kids experience um, uh, experience this. On the higher ed side, I feel like it's an, it's, uh, an industry um, that is deeply seated in tradition and has resisted um, um, transformation and change for a long time and is being forced to right now. Is being forced to, you know, like sometimes despite, <laughs> despite our own... Uh, uh, the desires we're, we're, we're having to think about things that we didn't have to before, like enrollment. If we don't do, if we don't open, we might not get students to enroll, which uh, could be uh, really dangerous for, for, for our institution. So we're asking these questions and it's forcing us to have to think about alternative ways and different ways to deliver value. And we're realizing what is really valuable in the college experience that we perhaps took for granted in the past. So it's a, it's, it's a moment of reckoning, I think, for higher education. Garth in the chat commented that we've been doing remote learning for decades. Sesame Street, Barney, Bill Nye, the science guy, we can do this sure. and it works. And I, but I think that's so, so interesting to look at what has worked, you know, because I think everyone's thinking what's not working, what's not working. And we do have models for a lot of this stuff. And I have to tell you, while I'm sitting here, I have to describe my screen. I've got you in the middle. I've got myself on the side, so I'm messing with my hair. I've got the Q&A open. I've got the chat open. I feel like an air traffic controller. You know, my work, in addition to writing, I lead webinars, right? I'm a professional speaker. And I've had to adapt to the fact that now I have um, the audience of my speech, where sometimes people are cameras on, sometimes they're cameras off. But I now have to also pay attention to the chat when I'm leading a discussion. And one of the things I've found that I really like is I think people ask much more honest questions in a private chat than they would by raising their hand in a big auditorium. And so I've tried to think about what are the opportunities within this virtual presenting for my own business. And that's been a big one is that the chat adds this entirely other element to the conversation, just like we're having now that wasn't there before. So I wouldn't want to lose that when we do go back to in-person. So I love this idea of what does work in this new model. Another example is kids who are introverted or kids who are bullied or kids with disabilities who are actually thriving by learning remotely. And so how does that add to the picture? It'd be unfortunate to lose that model. So I think when you look at what are the positives and the opportunities in this situation, let's keep those in the mix when we go to whatever this future can be. That, that, that absolutely is true. It is changing the dynamics. And I've seen that even with, with my own kids, but I've seen it elsewhere too, is that there are kids that didn't thrive. They didn't feel like they, be right. they belong um, in um, the all in-person model that are finding finally a voice. I'm, I'm so glad you're, uh, you're saying that. And um, there, so, so maybe I'll get comfortable with hybrid after all. <laughs> after, after having this conversation with you, this is, uh, this is good. Um, so I want to talk about 
everybody who is thinking, where do I go from here? You know, recalculating, where do I, where do I go from here? How do people redesign their career and their life trajectories out of this moment? What are the things that you're picking up and the, and the recommendations you're giving to people um, uh, about how to do this? So one of the things I found, I did a lot of interviews for the new book. And I think that in the past, when we talked about career change or pivoting, we talked about it as one moment in time. Well, I started as a recruiter. I'm going to change careers to a career services director, right? It was a one-time thing. And I think now what I have found is the people who are succeeding in this new disrupted COVID, post-COVID, global, everything's changing all the time environment, which I think has been around probably since the financial crisis, if not earlier, and we're just kind of catching up with ourselves, is that recalculating or pivoting is no longer a one-time thing. You have to constantly be rejiggering and rethinking in order to keep up with what's happening. So what does that mean? If you are happily in a job, I would still recommend that you continue to upskill yourself by taking classes, by doing LinkedIn learning to make sure that any areas where you see that there's some development that could take place, don't ever rest on your laurels. You've got to keep your skills sharp. Um, If you're in an industry, particularly if you're junior, you have to keep up with the industry news to see what's coming down the pike so that you are educating yourself and keeping your eyes open. So whereas I think we used to think, you know, I can coast for a while, And then pivot if I have to. I don't think we have that luxury anymore. You have to keep your network sharp. I remember um, I pitched myself as a networking speaker back in the early 2000s to an introduction I had at Lehman Brothers, you know, where the story is going. And the woman said, we don't need you. Everybody here has a strong internal network. People love working here. They never leave. Why would we have to learn how to network? And voila, in 2008, it probably would have been helpful to know how to network if you worked at Lehman Brothers. So I think this idea that you can just say still is just no longer the case. It probably was never really true, but I think now that idea of pivoting and constantly moving and adjusting. And if you look at like NACE research that some of the companies that are most successful in retaining millennials are the ones that have rotational programs. They sort of allow you to recalculate within their companies. And so I think that the way organizations can approach this is the same as individuals. How do we give people flexibility, How do we give them mobility? How do we invite people to grow their networks and grow their skills internally so that we can keep them going? I think it's the same in universities. How do we keep our alumni engaged so that when they're going to reskill, they come back to us, they network with us, they come back to our career center so that you're sort of creating organizations that allow people to recalculate within them rather than assuming that recalculation means going somewhere else. Does that all make sense? It makes perfect sense, and I think going for um, using that analogy even further, um, I I like to talk to, with people about evolution rather than change, um, uh, because I feel like sometimes change means discounting the experiences of the past or the things that you have done in the past. But evolution really assumes that you're building on the foundations of what you've done before. So ev- so there is no regret. There is no I've wasted my time. Everything that you've done before is valuable, and it gives you the platform to uh, to move to uh, the the next thing. Um, I think this is a moment for people to really just pay attention to what's happening around us. Um, I've, I've said this to so many people: is uh, if if you're not sure where things are headed, just sit in your house and around your town for a few days and just listen and pay attention to what's going on. And you will spot the patterns and the trends just around you just by watching how many packages are suddenly coming to your house as opposed to before changes things just in terms of how people are eating out, how people are consuming entertainment, um, how people are learning or teaching. If you have children, you can just look at your own house. I mean, I think most of us, the way we use our homes has, ch- has changed too. Um, the, the functionality of the different rooms that, uh, that we used to use has, has changed. And uh, in fact, I was reading articles the other day that um, in real estate, the demand for homes with home offices has increased sharply and uh, where we're hearing of people exiting big cities like New York City, where you are. And uh, now there's this concept of Zoom towns. I don't know if you've heard about that. There's an article <laughs> about Zoom towns. Have you heard of Zoom towns? No, tell me. Tell I have to learn. 
So this is interesting. It's like this massive exodus, while massive, I don't know to what extent, but all these people who are leaving uh, New York City and um, um, uh, San Francisco and uh, and Chicago, they're moving to these towns that normally uh, they, they wouldn't have a huge influx of new residents. Uh, so usually they're suburban, but they're usually also these picturesque towns because people can work remotely now and yeah. they're moving there. And then these towns are being called Zoom towns because they're attracting now a new and different kind of resident. I it's love no longer it. just the, I heard Barbados not, is giving more visas. So you can move there <laughs> and, and work from paradise. Exactly. It's not the tourist. It's not the retiree. It's uh, when it is really the 30 and 40 year old or even 20 year old who is, who is wanting to save money or wanting a bigger house. And, uh, and they're, so it's out of the pandemic is the birth of Zoom towns with all these techies and these people who can now work from anywhere. So I'm seeing that this is changing real estate. It's changing probably transportation. It's uh, it's uh, it's a different type of traffic now that we're going to be talking about. It's not traffic on the road. It's traffic of the internet. So we're all having to boost our internet capacities. So I, I ask people to just pay attention, and that should give you the signals of what will be hot in the next d- decade, um, and what are the industries, and what are the skills, and what are the the the, the job functions that we think are, are going to be um, uh, in demand. And also it'll give you signals of the jobs that will no longer exist. And they probably are disappearing before our eyes today. And um, it all comes back to uh, rethinking your future, recalculating and um, um, think, uh, making a, a clear decision about the skills that you have to develop now. And I think that's probably going to be the most challenging part for most people is deciding on on making that investment and how to invest it and overcoming not only the financial obstacles and the personal circumstances, and they're different for, for all people, um, and I rec- recognize that, but also re- overcoming the fears and anxieties about having to go back and reskill. There's a lot to unpack in, in that conversation. What are your thoughts about that? I'm watching the chat while you're talking and there's a lot of conversation about where are these Zoom towns and what is our advice to, let's say a student who says, I wanna work fully remotely. That sounds great, right? And there are a lot of people. And um, I also wanna touch on this idea of jobs of the future. When I was writing this book, I got obsessed with that idea of jobs of the future. And as I started to interview recruiters and workplace experts and a lot of career services people, they really changed my thinking, which was stop thinking about jobs of the future, right? And, and robot, mm. you know, robot managers. Think about the jobs of now, because that's what's happening. And there's really kind of a long history of getting the predictions wrong <laughs> about what the jobs of the future are. And I have to remember, you're a Gen Xer like me. I don't know your experience, but in the 80s, everybody was studying Japanese because they said all the jobs of the future are gonna require you to do business with all these Japanese electronics companies, and you've gotta learn to speak Japanese. And then Japan goes into 10 years of a lost economy and that prediction was wrong, right? And so what a lot of the experts were telling me was, look at today, to your point, where are the packages being delivered? Who's thriving right now? I love LinkedIn and Handshake both have this feature, who's hiring now? That's a pretty good predictor of the next couple of years. And that's really where you wanna be. You can't plan a career now for 10 years from now, you have to work today. So I thought that was really interesting. On the question in Zoom towns and, you know, what do you do if you want to be fully remote? I interviewed the CEO of FlexJobs, who has always specialized in remote work. And there's a lot of tax issues with companies having their employees in the same state. So I think we are a little bit further away than we might think from this sort of fully remote, you can live anywhere and work anywhere mindset. You know, I have to just be cautious that most of these Zoom towns are pretty close to where people have been. So I'm in New York City. That might be New York, upstate New York or Connecticut or Massachusetts. Yes, there are people moving to Barbados and to Hawaii, but they know that they have a certain leeway on their job. You know, I think companies like Twitter, like Reddit, who have officially announced that you can live anywhere, that's a great bet for a student. But I think it is still a risk for a student to say, I'm going to go live in Utah and expect to get a job in New York City or San Francisco because that's where the future is going. I'm not, I want to know about you, but I'm not quite ready to make that call. I think the tax issues are going to be really big for companies. um, And I think enough employers haven't quite made that leap. 
That said, if you're entrepreneurial, you could certainly try to be a freelancer or, you know, get enough work to live in a very low cost place. I think a lot of Zoom towns are based on low cost of living. But that idea that you can live anywhere and work for IBM, I, I just don't think we're there yet. Um, I think another thing that was brought up in the chat um, uh, is that there's there will be a lot that will be missed uh, uh, from uh, being fully remote, and that's the connection with uh, with the network, with employees, mentoring from other people, from bosses that you can replicate only to a certain extent. But there is definitely value into the happenstance uh, conversations that happen at, at the water cooler. Um, so certainly, I think remote is proving to be much more efficient in many cases. Uh, but also, I mean, I think we what we need now is to figure out how to establish this sense of community and of mm -hmm. personal connections. Um, I feel like that's probably the, the technology that will figure this out in the, uh, next will probably make a lot of money because that's what people are craving uh, for, for the most part. And you're right, I think people who are making choices to, to move out, usually they stay within one or two hour drive. Um, uh, or maybe flights so that they can get back where, if things uh, uh, turn around. Who knows where, where all of this uh, goes? What, what this makes me think also, Lindsay, is that when we, when we make these broad strokes uh, thoughts, um, I know you and I recognize that it is, it is not the same situation for every single person and that people's circumstances and um, uh, their backgrounds and their own access to privilege uh, will play a role there, not only in the way to, to, to recalculate your own career and your own life, but also in terms of how you experience this whole new world of work that's unfolding in front of us. So what I'm talking about here is that a, a, a person who has solid access to uh, privilege, to network, to resources, um, uh, will experience this whole transformation differently from a, uh, uh, an underprivileged uh, person, whether that's uh, uh, a person of color or, or, a, or a first person to go to college in their families or a person who comes from a limited income, um, et cetera. So this pandemic is really pulling the, uh, the, uh, the, the cover out of all of that. And it's, uh, what it's showing is that the disparities are, are much bigger than we perhaps uh, realized before. It also, you know, I, I just read something interesting about how universities, one of the challenges is they don't just provide an education. You know, for a lot of um, lower income people, they provide housing, they provide food, they provide medical care, they provide uh, mental health care, you know, all of that. And, you know, in a way, employers do too. And so the choice of where to live or where to work is not just about the job. You know, so many people I interviewed, I, I did a whole section on, you know, how do you think about your priorities? Is it about whether you feel comfortable in a certain location because nobody has the same skin color as you? Do you need to be close to family because you take care of them financially or they take care of your children? There's so many different factors to think about. And I wanna jump on something else that you said, which is I think there's a misconception that every millennial and Gen Z wants to work remotely because they love technology. They are suffering through this more than anybody because all of the statistics and all of my focus groups, they are wanting the social nature of work. And I think to your point, we can talk about salary and career development all we want, but work is human and work is social and work is community. And so sure, we could all become freelancers, but I don't think that that's a recipe for success and happiness. So many millennials are saying, I want flexibility. I don't wanna to have to be at my desk nine to five, but work is where I meet people. Work is where I make friends. Work is where I you know, have mentoring. Work is where I meet people to date, right? How many people met their spouse at work? That's all very real. And so you know, using freelancing or somebody commented, using freelancing or remote work as sort of a stopgap, I think makes a lot of sense. But to assume that everybody wants that full-time forever, I don't think is the reality. Yeah, and, and, and mental health is really um, uh, having a big impact right now on, uh, mm -hmm. uh, on, on everybody going through this, just I mean, not, not just the pandemic issue, but also just the, the craving, the connection and the community and trying to find um, uh, a, a new pathway. Um, what are you finding there? Like what are, what, what are what, what some of the data, what are some of the conversations that are happening around mental health and, um, and what we're discovering out of this pandemic? I think we have been sitting on a mental health crisis for young Americans for a while now. 
um, you know, college campuses, I think the rates from 2009 to 2015 were up 30%. And I think some of it is that there's less stigma, you know, of using mental health services and, and you know, um, accessing that help. I think that there's going to be a crisis. I think the isolation, the financial distress, the uncertainty, the stress, the health related concerns, um, death and, and, you know, grief, I think all that is going to be critically important. I think universities have started to pivot uh, pre-pandemic. I think employers are starting to plan for increased mental health support services like EAPs, on-site uh, psychologists. Um, a lot of organizations that I've seen that have really young populations, I think the more progressive organizations as part of their remote work plan have a mental health plan. And just to give you one example, I worked with a client this summer and they had a very scripted plan for how every HR professional had a list of entry-level employees who would be contacted once a week consistently to check on their mental health. They were not going to leave any of that up to chance. Um, in November of last year, pre-pandemic, you mentioned I'm in New York, Wall Street had Mental Health Awareness Week. You could have knocked me over with a feather that Wall Street would admit that they had a mental health challenge. I mean, that was sort of something that never would have happened, I think, even mm -hmm. five years ago. Um, so I think that's important. I also think, um, I really want to address a question came in about um, diversity. I think that increasingly, and this is done a lot overseas more than the US, I think that mental health is going to be increasingly part of the diversity, equity and inclusion conversation, right? That mental health issues as a disability um, in some ways are going to be included a little bit more in those conversations that when we are inclusive, um, in our language and in our behavior and in our benefits and in our management, we have to include people with mental health concerns. So I think that one of the outcomes potentially could be that that is brought a little bit into the conversation. Um, can I throw this question to you, Ruth, that came in yeah. from, um, from Peggy? Does remote work make diversity, inclusion and belonging easier or harder? Um, we can recruit, recruit broadly, but harder to know the work culture. Do employers have more responsibility for onboarding and training and success of diverse employees? I think we should include race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, and I think mental health and disability. What do you think? Oh, that's a, so, such a good question. Does it make it easier or harder? Um, I... Uh, um, I want to. I mean, I think I want to lean lean into where first the 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 uh, the, the subject of onboarding, uh, which has always been an issue uh, for employers, just onboarding employees and then continuing to um, uh, invest in their success, whether it's in person or re or remote. That needs to be there and needs to be well worked out. So it's not just because we are transitioning to remote that we have to pay more attention to that. We needed to do that to the, the to to begin with. Um, I, I think in many ways, I think remote can help with the um, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion part because it, you start taking away some of the um, unspoken um, elements of discrimination that were used in not only hiring, but also in um, um, uh, bringing an employee in. So I'll, uh, let, me, let me throw this out there and see what you think of it. Um, the word fit is uh, a loaded word that is often used in the workplace, in recruitment, um, and in uh, performance evaluations, um, in uh, informal conversations with employees among themselves and between supervisors. And I think that that's a, a dangerous uh, word, and often, but I've heard it all my career. And, it's, and I've heard it not only said around me, I've heard it said about me. Um, that the, the idea that you're, uh, you, you might not be the right fit or you need to change certain aspects of who you are in order to fit into the culture of this organization um, is something that I think has been born out of an in-person work culture that um, you probably wouldn't see it manifest itself, at least not that way or not that much, if it was fully remote, because what remote is doing so beautifully now despite all of the other challenges with it, is that it's cutting through all of those elements of culture and, and it's uh, assessing people based on outcomes and based on skills and based on, on the work that they do. Um, it's, not, it's, it, it, um, it's not as much about who likes who 
and who's more popular and who enjoys hanging out with who and you know what happens in the workplace it's you know you start having campaigns uh against people for people you start having people ganging up on people and what happens a lot is that a lot of those are have to have um uh, to do with uh, people's cultures and where they come from. Um, what seems to be, uh, you know, what one person can be um, uh, applauded for being blunt and just upfront. Uh, where if they were a different kind of person, they would be told that they are rude and they are not a team player. Um, and uh, the the only reason that there's a difference sometimes it's because the two people because of difference in genders for example what a male does and what a what a woman does uh, uh, would be perceived completely different um, if uh, a black woman speaks her mind she's angry if uh, a white male speaks their mind they're assertive and these things are happening less in um, in a remote work so I think it, it helps in that sense but at the same time I will own that we are just at the in the early stages of learning how to work in Zoom. And um, we don't know what we don't know. There might be other things that are emerging um, out of this um, uh, crisis that we will learn about down the road that maybe we will realize that, there are, that it affects um, uh, people of underrepresented uh, backgrounds differently. Those are my thoughts. What are your reactions to what I just said? Oh, it's so hard. I wish I had an easy answer. And I think a lot of really smart people are working on this sort of overlay or overlap of diversity, equity, inclusion, and, and Zoom <laughs> and the remote work environment. Um, a couple of thoughts. I couldn't agree with you more on skill-based assessment. Um, and I always come back to the story of the orchestra um, auditioning violinists behind a wall and not seeing what they look like and just listening to the music. And I think the more we can move towards skill-based assessment to um, you know, take names off of resumes and you know all of those biases. I am all for it. Um, one of the things that I've seen in the well, there are two pieces I want to bring up on the remote environment. One is I do think you can be more exclusionary in a remote work environment because nobody knows what's happening when they're not on screen, right? So I could have a secret call with you, right? That nobody will see us in a conference room together. So I, I have heard there are some ways that Zoom can be exclusionary and even people who are more introverted, right? Not, might not speak up as, the, as much as they would in person. So um, I think that we have to be really cautious. Where I'm really optimistic is I think that you can have more visibility in a remote environment. And I think that leadership can have more communication with the rank and file. So for example, um, you know, with the killing of George Floyd, a lot of CEOs got on camera and spoke to every single person in their organizations in a way that really couldn't have happened if they were in 10 different offices. And so a lot of employees have said, I feel that I'm more connected to my leadership now because they talk to us more. There are more forums for us to communicate. Um, and I think that's happening from recruiting as well. Um, I don't think there are any you know, magical solutions for this, um, but one of the things I've seen with onboarding of interns, which is just a, a very small part of the market, is there was a lot of thought to how do we recreate the in-person experience um, and make it equal whether you are at home with your parents or in your own apartment alone. And so companies did things like internship in a box where everybody got the same package of materials, the same training programs, um, and it was entirely equal across the mark. They also, on the employer side, there was a lot more training to the managers of interns because they said, hey, Farouk, you've got a team of interns. We know you've never managed virtually before. We're going to give you a suite of management tools and training. And my thought was, why weren't we doing that in the first place? You know, when we were in the office, we sort of assumed in the office, everybody knew what they were doing and they didn't in a remote. But that level setting of what it means to be an inclusive manager, how to have inclusive meetings, we sort of wrote dot, dot, dot when you're remote, but I would take away the dot, dot, dot and provide that same training and that same equality for everybody all the time. Like one small example that I thought was brilliant is companies that gave every employee a virtual background and said, I don't care if you are low income and in an apartment that you don't want people to see, or if you are in your mansion in the Hamptons, we are all gonna use the same background because we are all equal here. And so I think some of these little things, um, you know, it doesn't matter what you're wearing because everybody you know, looks the same on Zoom. There's just a lot of creativity and opportunity there. And I, I wonder how we translate that into the office. So I feel like I'm rambling, but 
there's so many nooks and crannies to this conversation. And my hope is that we take the best of what we switch to during remote and we bring it back to the office and vice versa, because I think there's been some really creative thinking. And by the way, the chat is exploding. So I'm trying to keep up with that too. <laughs> You're better than that than, uh, than I am. So thank you for, uh, for paying attention to it. Uh, and, and really grateful for everybody who's, uh, who's commenting. Um, you know what this is making me think of, Lindsay, is um, uh, the higher ed side, I don't think is doing a really good job right now at uh, mimicking what employers are doing to try to create this new environment, um, uh, the, this new virtual environment. In many ways, higher education is supposed to, is, is, is working on, on preparing students for the future of work. Um, and when I look at universities and colleges, I mean, I think what we're doing right now is scrambling to figure out how do we teach online and how do we replicate the same college experience. And we might be missing an opportunity to prepare students for uh, this new workplace that will exist, that is already emerging, unfolding in front of our eyes, but that will emerge um, uh, over the next five to 10 years. Um, I know you've looked at colleges, you've looked at career centers specifically, you're talking to a lot of people like, like me and others, and you have opinions about uh, what needs to happen there, what are the transformations that need to happen, especially in this moment, because I see this as a catalyst moment for, mm -hmm. for, for, for a lot of universities to finally do the right thing and bridge the gap between higher education and the workplace. Um, so what have you learned about that? I just want to bring up Lee in the chat shared an article that countered uh, my discussion of the violinist behind the wall that actually that does not um, help with diversity. We really need to bring up the issue of whiteness, right? And, and white supremacist thinking. Um, and I think I would sort of play off that with my answer to you, which is, I think a lot of people, and there's also a question in the Q&A, what do you do if you're a millennial Gen Z and you get it, but your campus leadership doesn't get it? And they oh, like know. how higher ed has always been. I'm sure that resonates with, uh, with you and many others. Yes. You know, there are still people who de deny that any of this is gonna happen, right? That any of this is really an issue. And yeah. I think one of the one of the things we can't lose, so just to, to sort of make it real, I work with a law firm and about a year ago, they implemented one day a month work from home, one day a month. And this was revolutionary, right? And they had to have me come and train them on how to handle one day a month, right? And people were against, it was, it was super dramatic, right? Now look at us. And so all those people who were against this, I think there's an opportunity. We can't just go back to the old way and say, all right, we're back to normal. And, and so I think to this question of what do you do with those resistant people is you've got to show them the results of the successes, right? So all of the statistics that show that diverse boards of directors make for companies that have better financial results, that diverse student bodies, you know, increase retention numbers, you know, whatever is important in your field you know, I think in some ways that sort of it's the right thing to do is not going to cut it because then people would have changed already. We have to show the positive results that are metrics that work with other people. And so where I think millennials and Gen Zs are really strong is on the data, right? And is collecting the data that shows that a lot of this stuff works. And the reality is they're always going to be resistant people, but you're not going to change their mind by trying to tell them that it's a really good, smart idea. You're gonna to have to find the metrics that prove that it's successful. And so I think one of the things that we can do now, and Proof, I think you've been very strong at this in all of your roles, is to show the data. We increased X percent because we did this. And so we can't, um, what we can do now is collect data during this sort of grand experiment of remote work to prove the points that we've always believed in. Does that make sense? It makes a lot of sense. And I think data always um, uh, speaks louder than words. And um, I, um, uh, w one thing that I know we've been doing a lot um, is look at data um, to uh, show um, uh, the differences in experiences and in outcomes between um, students and graduates of different backgrounds um, and ask the tough questions of why do um, students of color have a different background from um, 
um, their counterparts who are not who, who are not of color? Why do students who have, who, uh, who are first generation or limited income have a different outcome? And uh, track that data and make a commitment that as an institution we are going to bridge that gap and have that difference equal zero at some point. And that will and and we are prepared to do whatever to get us there. And when we lead with data, then we are more prepared to do things that we're not otherwise willing to do. So if we realize that, for example, uh, shifting to uh, content as a strategy allows us to scale um, um, uh, our services and our programs and the impact for everyone, regardless of who they are, then that's, a, that's a, uh, an easier decision to make because now you know that you're doing it for a specific outcome and a specific, uh, a specific data point. I think that's what institutions of higher education really need to do overall. And for the first time, I think they're getting the right type of pressure because it's about numbers. And what you're seeing is that, you, you know, institutions of higher education watch rankings just like corporate corporations watch the stock market, right? So uh, they're, and now rankings are increasingly um, uh, including factors like uh, social mobility for underrepresented backgrounds. Uh, it's increasingly measuring, the, the rankings are increasingly measuring the right things. That's one. Two, universities are looking at enrollment, you know, at who applies to my college and who accepts my admission offer uh, to them. And are enrollments staying steady, increasing or declining? And for the first time, I think we're seeing um, um, that we're, we might be reaching a tipping point for higher education where uh, students in masses are making decisions of whether or not to enroll in certain colleges or not. I know I've had that conversation with many students who reached out to me and asked, so these are the offers that I have, well, which way to go? And then at the end of the day, they ended up taking the uh, more practical and uh, even if it means less prestige, prestigious, mm -hmm. uh, because it's more practical, especially in this environment. Why do I have to pay this much money to go to Zoom University? Is something we've all heard from uh, families as they contemplate this. This is a real conversation in boardrooms uh, of, in higher education all around the country. And uh, while at the beginning they were very um, resistant, universities were re very resistant to giving a discount to students to enroll eventually they ended up doing it because students now, I think, are realizing that they have the power. I think none of this should be surprising, but, you know, I've heard it say, you know, you don't really make a change until you're in enough pain, right? We've all felt this in That's our true. lives. That's true. Universities were not in pain. You know why that baby boomer or traditionalist university president didn't have to make a change? Because he or she wasn't in pain. And now you're starting to feel some pain of people not enrolling, of people going other places. I mean, I have to say, when I was a kid in the 90s, there was no, as a middle-class, quite privileged young person with an education, you went to college, full stop. I mean, there was no debate about it. That was the route to success. The fact that a majority of Gen Zs do not think college is required anymore, that is a seismic shift in our country. And oops, someone just said, preach, Lindsay. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a big deal. That's a big deal that people are saying, you know what, maybe college isn't the right decision for everybody. And you look, look at the rise of general assembly and LinkedIn learning, you know, and all these other ways. The fact that Google and EY and Accenture are not requiring you to have a college degree anymore. We've got to pay attention to that. And the vast majority of kids who go to college are not on a leafy campus like Johns Hopkins. They're at a community college, right? Or working, um, you know, five days a week to put themselves to school. If you actually look at the data, college is not what we perceive it to be. You know, most kids don't finish in four years. All the stereotypes are sort of wrong. Um, so I think it's going to be really interesting. I think the, the big, fancy, big name colleges. Did you see the Seth Godin article where he said, stop calling them good colleges or bad colleges? There are famous colleges and not famous colleges. I, I thought that, that was really interesting that it's not about the name anymore, you know, but I think the big, you know, the Ivy Leagues, I think will be fine, but every other industry in the world has been disrupted. Did higher ed think that it was gonna avoid that for some magical reason? You know, I think that's kind of short-sighted, but you know, it's easy for me to preach because I'm not there on campus like you are. <laughs>
<laughs> well, I am, and I can tell you that there is a real shift in higher education that's happening now for the good, because for the first time you see universities that are, that are starting to shift their attention from chasing prominence to chasing impact, uh, mm -hmm. social impact. Uh, it's really going back to the original um, contract with society, you know, between higher education and society. And that's, you know, we are a university because we want to have a social impact, global social impact, hopefully. Um, and I think they all say that on their mission statements and vision statements. But what happens behind the curtain and in, in boardrooms is that it's really, you know, like looking at, at uh, ratings and prominence and, uh, and uh, that's donor changing. money. And, it that's is changing. changing. It is changing. That's changing. So. And that's what's going to move the needle is that the corporations say, eh, we're going to hire any kid. We have access to all the data. We're not going to have target schools anymore. You know, what's going to happen when companies don't have target schools anymore? So that's um, um, so, so many think that we might have finally reached the tipping point for universities. But I still think we're a little bit further. We're, 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 mm -hmm. we're close, but we're not there yet. And I think what will happen is that when the majority of employers do what these few companies that you've mentioned uh, are doing, which is not not only not requiring, but not valuing it to that much. Um, you know, I mean, even like when I get questions sometimes, like, should I get an MBA or should I get the, what used to be the prestigious one? Now I'm saying, I mean, only get the MBA if you think that there are great skills you, you want to get from that. Uh, but if you're getting it just for the credential alone, uh, because you think that um, the name of MBA is going to buy you an, an admission ticket somewhere, uh, think twice before you do that, because it might not. It's changing. And, and, and I think what we'll see over the next two decades is a different way of credentialing skills um, that, uh, will, uh, that will be parsed out you know, in different ways that uh, uh, will change this whole formula. You said you agree. Yeah, I'm not allowed to get political, but we also have to fund community colleges and state universities. I mean, the, the lack of funding for these schools is why community colleges should be general assembly, right? They should have the credentialing that these for-profit companies, which are very good, uh, have come in and kind of filled that gap because they just don't have the funding, right? And I think a lot of prestigious universities are going to have to make really hard choices about which departments they're able to fund and which ones they aren't. Every college can't be all things to all students. And I think that's another piece of the puzzle. What are the top skills that uh, everybody needs to have for the next couple of decades at work? I mean, I'm an obsessive fan of the soft skills, right? And actually I've become a brand ambassador for Capfinity and they've defined like the five soft skills. And I think all of us could probably name them, right? Critical thinking, communication skills, agility and resilience. It's not coding. Right. Coding is certainly important for certain jobs, but, you know, anyone can learn a certain skill set. What we're all going to need is the ability to analyze data, to think about that data, you know, and a lot of the things that haven't really changed much. And unfortunately, um, because we sort of when I think job of the future, I think we tend to think about coding when in actual fact, we should think about these other skills. And, and to be really honest, I think, you know, this idea of recalculating and agility right? And being able to pivot is going to be one of the most critical skills because what your job is today is not going to be your job five years from now. And I think people have to kind of expect that. Um, so, you know, I wish I could say exactly what they are, but I don't think that they're really all that different than, than people would expect. I think the World Economic Forum puts out a list and critical thinking is almost always on the top, but I'd love to hear, hear your opinion on that. But my vote is yeah, soft skills. And I, and, and, and I, I've been wanting to rebrand them for a long time, and I know you probably have too. I don't ever yeah, want to call word. them soft yeah. again. I agree. Uh, I agree. I know some somebody said here core skills, which uh, it is a core, good one. I've been I've I've been using success skills a lot, but I I'm I'm in full agreement, and I think especially I mean there have been a lot of articles about uh, this move towards automation, and if we imagine a world uh, uh, that is run mostly by machines. Um, um, and algorithms, um, the, 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 the few things that machines and algorithms have, don't, haven't figured out how to do yet um, are those soft skills. And uh, I think that that's what it's going to be the comeback of the liberal arts and of humanities and colleges. So um, um, I think that that's probably the bet that colleges should make is to invest heavily 
still in the liberal arts and the humanities and um, in um, the development of those skills. In addition to that, I mean, I think that, that that's an opportunity for career centers, for example, in, in universities, is to step into that. Um, and I've, I've been um, an advocate for transforming career centers from service providers to something else. And this could be one of those something else is we, we, that we're, we, we teach the skills of the future, you know, the work skills of the future. And uh, uh, um, because no one else on campus really is claiming that um, as uh, their, their core mission. And by the way, I think there was a moment of clear, or there was a question for clarification of what yeah, I, I want to earlier. talk about Susan's question about, you know, sort of core skills or essential skills or where was Jose Miguel called them uh, power skills. Um, Susan is a recruiter and she said, I have to find people who have the technical skills that I need. So core skills and technical skills like coding cannot be mutually exclusive. You know, I wonder in some ways if it's like, you know, when I was in high school, there were kids who were on the trade track, they were gonna become electricians, you know, and mechanics. And then there were kids who were on the, the college track. I, I think Susan said, well, how come colleges are not teaching these skills? Again, I don't think a university can be all things to all people. I don't know if Johns Hopkins can teach Shakespeare and coding. And, you know, I think you have to make some decisions at a certain point, right? Of what you're going to specialize in. Um, and, you know, in other countries, kids have to decide a lot earlier what career path they're going to go on, right? Whether they're going to go to school for law, whether they're going to go to school for coding, you know, we sort of let people take a lot longer to decide. And I'm not saying that's wrong but it's a different philosophy of education, right? I lived in Australia for several years and you decided in high school what path you were gonna go on and that's how you chose your university and that's where you settled. And we just don't do that in our country. I think there's a huge move towards apprenticeships, right? To get kids on that track. So I guess the question is, are universities gonna sort of choose their lane and say, this is what, you know, these are the kinds of jobs we prepare people for community colleges, the general assemblies of the world, you know, I'd love for Susan to weigh in more, but I think that's a really good question. What is the job of a university? And is it to pivot every time there's a, a change in where the economy goes? I don't know the answer to that. Um, and th this calls, I think, for a change of how um, uh, education is structured. I mean, I think it, I think historically it's been structured in a packaged way. That's what universities have done so well over the last uh, few hundred years is learn how to package education into these different uh, packages, you know, that, that in, in the form of majors, mm -hmm. if you will, to students. Mm -hmm. And I think the shift that we're experiencing now is, is to break that and go towards skills instead. And when you go towards skills, it's less of saying to, to, to students, you buy this package and this is what you get to learn. But instead, we have this large menu of skill development opportunities. You, mm -hmm. you choose the skills you want to learn for the, the vision that you have for yourself. And then you come back and reskill anytime throughout your lifetime. Um, it's very similar to a concept called Open Loop University. You might have heard of that. That mm -hmm. came out of during my Stanford, time out yeah. at, at Stanford. Uh, there's St Stanford 2025. And, and there was sort of a re-envisioning the university. And one of the models was Open Loop University. And it's the idea that you don't, you're, you're not admitted and then you have a finite time and then you graduate and you have a degree, you go to commencement and then you move on. But instead you're admitted for life and you're looping in and you're looping out based on the skills you develop. Uh, so you come in, you take a few courses and then you loop out and go work somewhere. And then when you dis when there is a need for new skills, you come back or maybe you come back and teach and so on. And I think that's much more realistic based on uh, the paradigm shifts we're experiencing than what we've seen before. Um, we are coming to, to to the end of the hour here. Is there anything that you wanted to address from the chat box? And we can't address them all, but if there's something um, <laughs> there, um, otherwise I would love to ask you a final question so we can wrap this up. Uh, Thank uh, you all see. so much. The chat is just fantastic. <laughs> I really appreciate everybody tuning in and just so many people here. Um, <laughs> Amy asked, um, can we do another hour? <laughs> <laughs> I want to do another hour. Lindsay, I want to ask you two questions. The first is uh, uh, anybody who is thinking about recalculating their pathway forward, what do they need to do? What are the, 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 the stepping stones, uh, the, the steps that they need to take? And then I'll ask you my second question uh, after that. 
First of all, I invite everyone to follow me on LinkedIn. I'm posting tons of content on how to recalculate. The book is coming out in March. Um, so I'll be posting all the way up until then. And thank you for the opportunity to share about it. Um, there are a couple of thoughts on recalculating. Number one is a mindset shift that this is not a one-time decision, right? So you have to be in the mindset of reskilling, networking, always thinking about the next move. And I know that sounds exhausting, but I think we all do it anyway. And so to be a little bit more mindful and admitting that that is where we are, that we shouldn't be shy or ashamed about it, and that it's a good thing to always be pivoting and moving forward. Um, I think the second thing is to be really creative and innovative about our own careers. So I think a lot of people get really stuck in a certain kind of thinking, well, I'm a higher ed professional, so that is what I do, when there's a lot more out there. Um, that could be really interesting to people. Um, and I would say the third thing is to be really practical in thinking about where am I lacking skills or where do I feel like I might be falling behind and actually, as you said, looping back in, right? And keeping skills sharp and moving forward. Um, I think where people fall down is when they stay still. And so anything that keeps you moving forward is a way of recalculating. And again, I think we all do this, but we need to be a little bit more deliberate about it. Very good. And I'll add my, my piece to all of that is just watch and pay attention to everything that's happening around you. The patterns are right there at your doorstep. Uh, Lindsay, one image that describes the future for you? Uh, obviously, a GPS recalculating, Peru. <laughs> You know, I you wanna, I did I do not practice address this. Something. I'm such a marketer. I do want to address something you said, which is it doesn't mean your past is irrelevant. Because remember, when our GPS recalculates, yes. it takes into account what got you here. And I think that's really that's important. Fair. This is not about throw away the past. It's all changed. Let's reinvent the future. It's take everything you know and use that to inform what you do next. And I think that's a really important piece of it. So yeah, I'm going to be very self-promotional and say a GPS recalculating. That is brilliant. I actually did not expect that answer from you, uh, but, but uh, of course, it makes perfect sense. That's that's brilliant. Great, uh, great answer. Uh, this has been so much fun. I wish we could do another hour. It's always great to uh, to chat with you. I appreciate everybody who tuned in today. And uh, remember, everyone, there's um, only one way to predict the future is to create it. I wish you all the very best, and uh, we'll see you next time. Bye bye. Thank you.